हेलो टीम गुड आफ्टरनून वेलकम टू ए सी टी टेक टॉक थर्टी वन टूडे वी हैव स्पीकर डॉक्टर आईसिन टैन फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ आईवा प्लीज वेलकम डॉक्टर लू ऊ रिसर्च साइंटिस्ट एडवांस एक्रोमेट्रिक्स ए सी टी नेक्स टू इंट्रोड्यूस टूडे स्पीकर एंड टॉपिक ऑफ टूडे टेक टॉक Good afternoon everyone. I am very honored to introduce you today today's Tech Talk speaker Dr. Ai Xin Tan. Dr. Tan is an associate professor of statistics and actuarial science at the University of Iowa. She serves as, a, as an associate editor for a top statistic journal, the Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics. She earned her degrees in statistics from Peking University and the University of Florida. Her talent and expertise in Bayesian modeling and computing set foundations for our potential collaboration on innovating modeling and computational techniques for efficient and holistic measurements. Her ties with ACT lead further beyond research. She is the wife to our lot former colleague Ray Tao. The happy couple met each other when they played mixed doubles during college. They are now proud parents of three adorable children, and their newborn is just two months old. Today, Dr. Tan will talk about theories and practices in Bayesian computing. The whole session is to be recorded. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them with the relevant slide number in the chat window. At the end of the talk, we will have about 10 minutes for Q&A and open discussions. Let's now give the stage to Ai Xin. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lu.、Uh, that's a very kind introduction from you.、Um, uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> It's my great pleasure to talk about Bayesian computing with you today.、Um, thanks for joining me at lunchtime. I hope you're hungry for some Markov chain Monte Carlo.、Um, so I'll、uh, first go to the menu. Okay.、Um, Okay,、um, I hope you see the、uh, outline page.、Um, I will start giving a brief introduction to Bayesian statistical methods, of which a major challenge is computing. The most popular computing、uh, method up to now is Markov chain Monte Carlo, shortened as MCMC. It's not a single algorithm, but actually a huge class of algorithms that you can choose from or invent more for any given problem. Um, part two of my talk is meant to tell you that using the MCMC tools nowadays is not hard. I will present basic ideas behind the algorithms and give you a list of available software. There are several software that put these different fancy algorithms totally in the black box, so it's convenient for the user who does data analysis. Well, in part three of my talk, I'm going to step back and tell you. If you want to use those black boxes responsibly and efficiently, you still need to know certain properties of the algorithms. Otherwise, you can feel like you're running with closed eyes. Despite increasingly powerful computers nowadays, you can run out of computing resource before getting a reasonably accurate answer. Choosing and developing more efficient algorithms are very relevant these days. And I'll give you a couple of examples in the end. All right. First up,、um, some basic Bayesian, well, or statistical inference.、Um, when you do modeling, you are perceiving data as generated from some system. And when you do statistical modeling, you acknowledge that the system involves randomness and won't spit out deterministic results over repeated runs. So part of this system is assumed known. And the rest are the unknowns that we can call the parameters theta. Now, making inference is a process that goes the other direction. Okay, the goal is to make educated guess about plausible values of the unknowns theta, based on the observed data d. Exactly how we do that? There are more than one way, and Bayesian method is one way to do that. Bayesian model. Um, involves two parts. There's a data distribution part, the PD given theta, 
it represented, reflected how the data was generated from the unknowns. And they also need a prior distribution that reflects your belief, understanding of the unknowns before you collect the data. And in terms of probability language, this is very simple. You have a distribution of theta, a condition of D given theta, all together that gives you the full picture, the joint distribution of the unknown and the data. That's the Bayesian model. How do you use the model to do inference? Inference, as I said earlier, is having seen the data imply, what does that imply about the unknown theta? Naturally, the answer would be answered by, this question would be answered by the conditional distribution of theta given D and in Bayesian modeling that's given the name posterior distribution. Okay, it's just the joint divided by the marginal of D and if you write it out, is this combination of data distribution and prior divided by some normalizing constant to make this distribution pi a density that you know integrates to one. Okay. So on this next page on top, I repeated this formula or Bayesian rule, and I'm going to give you a visualized example. In this toy example, we have a single test question, and our goal is to make inference of the easiness of this question. Uh, let's say to, to reflect that easiness, maybe we'll define the parameter theta to be population proportion of students who get it right. And in reality, you will collect data. Maybe uh, you let 20 students work on this problem independently, and each one get a correct or incorrect has a one or zero score, okay? So first I would like to point to this red curve is the prior density. Uh, ideally, it's a distribution that reflects my knowledge about the easiness of the question before testing it on students. And it should be obtained by consulting the test developer. In this case, uh, the test developer would say, well, uh, it's most likely the population of students who get it right is between 40% and 90%. Uh, and we don't want them to be too informative about it, okay? So give it uh, the amount of uncertainty it deserves. It's just a guess. And you can say it's very unlikely that less than 10% or more than 95% of the students should get it right. That's my prior understanding of the easiness of the question. Now, having observed field data, I'm going to update my prior belief using this black curve, okay? That corresponds to the data distribution part. It's also called the likelihood function if you see it as a function of theta. So combining the red curve and the black curve, you know, multiply them together and renormalize, it gives you the blue curve. That is the shape of your posterior density, okay? And that's your updated belief of the easiness of the question. So I have another picture on the right that says, what if you accumulate more data points? In this case, uh, 100 students are enrolled and 75 of them got it right. And you could see the blue curve, the posterior, now resembles the likelihood function even more. Uh, basically, Bayesian inference is a system that allows you to consider prior information, but as data becomes more informative about the unknowns, um, the posterior will drift towards uh, what the data suggests. Um, now this is, again, this toy example, I'm only showing the posterior curve, the blue curve here. Uh, more on how do we actually make inference for theta, that is what conclusions should we draw after obtaining this density. If it's a one-dimensional problem, uh, I would just show people the graph of pi, okay? This is the whole picture of my belief about theta after collecting data. It's most likely that the test will uh, have easiness between, you know, 0.7 and 0.9 and if you want, you could describe that better with summaries, uh, saying, okay, there's a, a most credible interval or the interval that contains the most plausible values of theta, uh, and that's showing the shaded area here. If you want a one number summary, you could also choose the posterior mean or the posterior median. Uh, someone likes mode, 
Um, so there are a bunch of summary statistics you could uh, uh, derive based on this picture. Okay, so if the Bayesian method sounds so nice, um, why isn't the kind of the only major tools we use in data analysis? Mm, part of the reason is there are challenges uh, when you do Bayesian analysis. The first one is the choice of model. Many people complain about, well, Bayesian method requires me inputting a prior. How do I get that? Okay. Um, and then uh, once you have a fixed model, uh, computing is a huge problem. And sometimes if you can solve the computing problem, it can help you solve one too, because if you have the tool to try different models and see what type of inference, what's, what's the difference they make, uh, you can have uh, a better idea of which model uh, seems to fit the data better or gives a better prediction, more sensible, and so on. A little, a little bit of detail on how people face those challenges. For model choice, I would say it's not the Bayesian analyst that face these problems alone. As long as you're doing modeling, you have to choose a data distribution. And there are a huge amount of assumption made in it. If you think about all this uh, projection about COVID-19 running the news every day, if you look into their paper, you'll be surprised or amazed by how many assumptions they make and you can disagree with them uh, greatly, okay? Uh, and anyways, uh, for Bayesian, you just have an extra piece of uh, information, the prior that you have to uh, find out. Uh, ideally, you use domain knowledge and expert opinion as much as possible. Uh, or after you specify a certain model, you want to do model diagnostics. Uh, there are also information criteria, AIC, BIC, and for example, BIC is actually approximation to what we call the base factor. Um, I'm not going into the details. And now for the computing problem, the posterior distribution pi is actually intractable, except for two examples I just showed you. And if your unknown theta is a vector, it's really of high dimension. It could be hundreds of unknown parameters in there. Calculating, for example, the posterior mean or the posterior mean of some function of interest f of very high dimensional compute, uh, high dimensional integral. And it's a difficult problem. So there are four common solutions and more. I will go over uh, some of them in the next few pages. So I'll just remind you of uh, two subtle notations here. Small n in my talk will represent data size and capital N will represent the amount of computing effort, such as the Monte Carlo sample size in MCMC methods. Now recall on the previous page that our common goal is for a difficult probability distribution pi. How do we approximate posterior means? First up is analytical approximations. Um, it means you use an easy or or a distribution that you know very well can do calculations uh, for as an approximation to the actual pi. One popular example is the following, is to use a uh, multivariate normal distribution that's centered at the maximum likelihood estimator of theta and some estimation of the feature information inverse of that as the variance. Um, there are some theory behind why approximation works and uh, it mostly works when you have large data size. Another requirement for this approximation to work is that the dimensional parameters should be fixed when you collect more sample size. And a counter example of that, okay, when that doesn't happen is for example, the IRT models uh, where you include students ability. As you collect more students, you have more parameters, more student ability uh, to estimate as well. So you will have to use some strategy to integrate out student ability before you can do uh, approximation using this type of uh, computing method. And anyways, um, I uh, looked for examples around and you probably have looked at this Chris, Ma Chris Morris model for COVID-19 projections at University of Washington. It's probably the most highly cited projection uh, in the public and by the White House. Um, and if you look into their paper, 
uh, the basic idea is they did Bayesian modeling and they used this uh, fast approximation uh, to get useful results. Okay, um, next up, numerical integration. It worked only in low dimensions. Um, basically, the method is to uh, create a grid of points on the theta state space and evaluate pi, the density pi on them, okay? And somehow uh, come up, use that to approximate the overall integration. Um, the problem with that is the number of grid points you have to use will grow exponentially in the dimension. In one dimension, you use 10 grid points. For similar accuracy in two dimensions, you need 10 by 10 to 100. In D dimension, you need 10 to the D's power. And if you have an infinite uh, interval to estimate integral over, there's even a bigger problem. Okay, now here's the third solution uh, by doing sampling. I'll give you the details later because that's the main part of this talk. Uh, but some of the features, if your Monte Carlo sample size effort is capital N, and the error is controlled at this one over square root n scale, and it will not depend on the dimension of pi. Okay, not depend on the dimension of pi. That's a big thing. And there are theoretical guarantees that the estimates based on this sampling method will converge to the truth if the computing effort increases. Okay. In comparison, there's also a very hot competitor for a computing solution, that's variational approximation. Someone called them variational inference, hence VI. Uh, the idea of VI is uh, a little bit similar to the analytical one. It's you think about a tractable family of densities. For example, you assume all the uh, components solution are independent. And maybe that's simple enough for you to uh, do analytical uh, approximations. Uh, but anyway, when you posit a tractable family of densities, you want to find the family member that is the closest to your target pi. And this procedure involves optimization, and that's less costly than MCMC in general. It generally provides pretty good point estimates, especially when you have large data size, uh, hence the approximation is you know, closer, usually. But the problem is, for example, when you assume independence among components, you're ignoring the correlations between them. And as a result, it may underestimate posterior spread correlation and produce overly narrow uh, credible intervals, for example. So good for point estimates, need some work uh, when you need a bigger picture. Uh, and as I mentioned here, uh, the variational approximation method does not converge to this truth when you uh, increase the computing effort. Okay, so here's the summary page, a list of all four solutions I've covered, and you're welcome to uh, come back to this when you get the slide after my talk. Um, any questions so far? Okay, um, now I'm going to dive into the basic ideas of that third solution, Monte Carlo and Markov chain Monte Carlo. First, simple Monte Carlo solutions. I'm going to generate IID samples uh, from the distribution pi. So th th using this solution requires you to be able to generate IID samples from pi. And for a large enough capital N, um, you would say the sample approximates pi sufficiently so that the sample mean, sample percentile, and so on will approximate the true mean, true percentile of pi. Here's a simple example, the true pi here, my target is a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 15. Uh, I assume I don't know any of these blue things, the shape of the density, uh, the mean, and say the 90th percentile. What I will use, uh, what, but I assume I can generate IID samples from it. So IID stands for independent and identically distributed, okay? So I got 50 samples, and you could see the histogram here. If you look at the sample mean, it's pretty close to the truth. And if you look at the 90th percentile from the sample, uh, it's a little bit off. Okay. Uh, you could increase your computing effort fourfold. Now you have 200 samples. This is a histogram. You could see the posterior mean estimate improved. And 
a huge improvement is seen in the uh, percentile estimates. Uh, just a reminder, the error size is about the size of 1 over square root n, so it means a fourfold increase in n reduces the random error by half. Okay, so that's the simple Monte Carlo solution. It's beautiful, but it has a, high pre, uh, a big prerequisite. That is, you need to be able to generate samples from pi. Oops. Um, MCMC solution is more applicable in that you can consider more complicated pi's. And instead of the independent random variables, you generate a sequence of dependent random variables such that the distribution of the nth random variable will converge to the truth. That is, the longer you generate this sequence of random variables, uh, the, later, the, the later random variables will have distribution that's similar, getting closer and closer to the true target. With this idea, we, we, equipped with such a uh, random variable generation uh, tool, uh, that imagine after a warm-up, uh, the samples after this will all have distribution close to pi, and these can mimic you know, the IID random variables and uh, give you approximates. So it turns out coming up with such an MCMC solution is surprisingly easy. That's what I'm going to talk about in part two. However, being responsible for that solution is a much harder task. And to explain how come this could be surprisingly easy, uh, I would need to introduce some jargons. Uh, those who are not interested uh, can, well, take a nap for a minute. So first we say a Markov chain is invariant with respect to a given distribution pi. If you start the Markov chain with x1, this first random variable following pi, and moving one step according to the Markov chain rule, it will give you an x2 that also follows the same distribution pi. This is a one-step property to establish, and it actually leads to the same marginal distribution at all times in the future. Turns out, under very mild extra conditions, a Markov chain with any start x1, you don't need to start it from the invariant distribution step, with any start, it will eventually converge this invariant distribution, uh, meaning what's here, what we want, x1, x2, you know, when xn, when n is large, it will have a distribution that's closer and closer to pi. That's what I mean by converge. And it's like you are making a small effort to establish a one-step property, and it somehow leads to this long-term property that you need. Okay, so that's my part one. Um, any questions? All right. Um, so I will dive into uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo recipes now. So you see uh, there are many, many recipes out there, but in reality there's just one, okay? It's called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, here's the basic idea. If you're currently at X, say capital X1 is at X, you propose a move to a new point Z according to some arbitrary density Q. This Q is not necessarily related to pi, it's just a proposal. You adjust this proposal towards pi by giving it acceptance rate. You accept the proposal with the following probability alpha. If you flip a coin with this probability, it lands up on head, you move to Z, x2 equals to Z. If you flip the coin with a tail, you reject this move, so you stay at the original point, that is x2 equals to x1. First of all, the pi z over pi x part in this uh, acceptance probability encourage the chain to move to areas of high pi probability. The proposal density Q itself is arbitrary. It's the acceptance rate that really drives the chain to have the correct invariant distribution. Since there are so many possible choices of Q, you want to know what are good ones. An ideal Q should be able to propose large moves in the state space to explore, but with high acceptance rates. You don't want to make a proposal and never have the chance 
to get the flip up coin has had to go there, right? Um, so this is a good time to do a demo. Um, I will talk about random walk metropolis hastings first. Um, so the basic idea is you're going to make a move that follows a multivariate normal distribution standard at zero with a certain standard deviation or we call step size. Okay, so I'll change the screen that I share. That might take a few seconds. Okay. So if you click on the random walk metropolis has things, um, I'll just I'll just stop the simulation for a second. Reset. Okay. Um, so what you he see here is an example of a bivariate uh, distribution pi. Uh, that's supposed to be the pi of interest. Okay. Uh, this is the contour plot uh, with higher density. When the color is darker, it means there's higher density. And when there's lighter color, there's uh, ignore ignorable amount of density over there. So what we want is to get a sample from this probability density. Uh, we do, what we want is to have samples that kind of cover this entire banana shape. What we don't need what we don't want is not something that converges, say, to the mode here. That's not the purpose of Bayesian computing. Okay, I'll go to get a sample. So let's see how random walk metropolis has things do it. Uh, what you see here first is a starting value. I just click step once. Okay, so over here, the center of the circle is an arbitrary starting value. Uh, you can call that x, y, okay, the coordinate. And uh, you propose a move that follows a bivariate normal, the con contour of the bivariate normal density is given here. And uh, the realization of that move happens to be this uh, vector pointing upward. And given that proposed point Z, you calculate the acceptance rate, turns out, and then flip a coin, turns out the coin flip up head, so it's green, you can go there. So you had X1, and now your X2 is this point that you move to. Let me take another step. Now you're at X2, you propose a move in the right. Um, and it's a pretty big uh, step by chance. And let's see. Ooh, and especially since uh, this proposed move is kind of in a low density area, uh, it's not surprising uh, we reject uh, the move over there. Okay, we can just try a few more. So once you reject that, your X3 will be same as X2. And now it's a proposal for X4. Again, rejected. Another proposal, again, rejected. And then by chance, you have a very small move and it's, that's usually accepted. Okay, you just keep doing that. And you could see uh, there's a certain acceptance rate with this choice of move. And there's theoretical guarantee that eventually all these black dots will cover the banana shape. Uh, to be more specific, if you look at the accumulating histograms, say, on the bottom of the screen. That is, if I only concern, I'm concerned with the uh, X coordinate, uh, these are the samples I get. And the smooth curve is actually the uh, marginal of the true density. And eventually, this histogram is guaranteed to approach the true density. Um, of course, it's a matter of time. Better algorithm will make that happen faster. Less efficient algorithm will take uh, a long time, maybe forever to, to converge there. Okay, so let me stop. Oops. Uh, okay, um, so let's try to tune one thing, the step size. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this tab, at first I use the step size of one. Now if I make it smaller, I say, well, you're proposing big moves into you know, the irrelevant area for pi. Maybe let me use smaller baby steps and get higher acceptance. Uh, let's see what happens. So in, the case, in this case, you start uh, at a, not a very good region, okay? But you're gradually approaching the relevant area of the density pi, okay? So you got there. Uh, this kind of warm-up period uh, happens if you don't start um, 
in the center. Okay, so you see you see green arrows most of the time. So it's a high acceptance rate. So the chain is gradually moving, but they're making baby steps. So imagine your goal is to explore entire banana shape. You're supposed to go to say the left corner somehow, and it takes maybe hundreds of steps to actually reach there. And once they are there, they will spend quite a lot of time in here and it will change, say, this histogram on the bottom a lot. Okay, so when you stop the chain, then uh, matters a lot, and you might get a biased or highly variance answer. So this is not ideal. Okay, baby step with high acceptance rate is not ideal. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about of random walk metropolis hastings, which is based on the idea of proposing uh, simple moves from the current point. Um, there are much fancier ways to propose moves. One of them is the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, I'll just show you a picture to impress you. Okay. Uh, so you're starting somewhere uh, and you make a proposal. Well, uh, look how daring this proposal is, okay? And it actually gets accepted, okay? And another one. Oh, okay, it runs out of the screen. But uh, the point is uh, you can make very big step explorations and still get, get a good chance of getting accepted, at least in this example. Um, so behind the scene, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is uh, making a proposal that follows some physical idea. Imagine you have a little object that's, you know, moving on the smooth inside of this banana-shaped bowl with a certain starting velocity. And this is a discretized version of how it will move. Um, and um, basically, that's the intuition, OK? So the point is, if you can think creatively and find a proposal that gives you large moves with higher acceptance rate, that's going to give you a more efficient algorithm. Um, so before I go back to the screen, I'll just share you what Gibbs sampler look like. Gibbs sampling is actually also related to metropolis hastings. It's like a composite of several metropolis. In this case, two. In this di two dimensional case, two. Um, I'll try the step. Okay, that, that's too small. Let me try a different step. See if you can give me a bigger one. Oh, okay. Um, so if you start over here on this point, one iteration of the Gibbs sampler involves two steps. Okay. First, you fix the height, okay? You fix Y coordinate, and you somehow you can derive, it's actually pretty easy to derive the conditional distribution of the X random variable given Y. So basically cutting across this density of pi and sampling from that conditional distribution. This turns out to be a proposal with acceptance rate one, okay? So you move there. And then the second step of this iteration, you would fix the X coordinate and sample from the conditional of Y, and then you end up going here. And as I said, it's acceptance rate one all the time. Okay, so this is how you move along with Gibbs sampler. It's a composition of D metropolis hastings where D is the dimension of the target. Okay. So any question before I go back to my slides? Nothing so far. Okay, um, good. Thank good. you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it takes some effort to go back, so that's why I'm asking. Stop share. Oh, one question. Here's one. Oh, Here's okay. one. Okay. Are there formal methods for determining the size of N0, the MCMC burn in quantity? Oh, that's a very good question. That's actually my entire section three of the talk. You have to be a little patient. Uh, for, okay, for that. so that's coming up. Okay, good. Yep, thank you. That's a very relevant question. Yeah, responsible people ask those questions. Yep. Okay, uh, so I'm back to the screen. Uh, there's more details in here than what I just said, but similar idea, okay? Uh, you're welcome to read this later on and uh, try this demo made uh, available by Chi Feng. Um, all right. Uh, okay, a little bit more summary. Uh, there's only one idea, essentially, metropolis hastings, if you consider trans-dimensional 
Markov chain. There's also Metropolis Hastings Green. Um, so I went over random walk Metropolis Hastings and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, so the main difference, why could Hamiltonian Monte Carlo make both efficient moves? It's because it used extra information than the simple Metropolis Hastings. Uh, what it did is it calculates the gradient at each point, uh, which means basically the shape of the density pi, which way is it going, which way is going up, which way is going down. And that helps you get local properties in hope of more efficient exploration. Okay, if you explore a mountain blindly, it's not as good as you know, knowing a map of the mountain, uh, kind of at least a local map. Um, so it doesn't come for free. Calculating the gradient means extra computing cost. It could be uh, huge if you have a complicated problem. Uh, however, in return, you get efficient exploration. It means less iterations needed for a solution of a certain accuracy. Okay. Um, I'll skip the details for Gibbs sample. Okay. Now, Software, uh, for me as a researcher who actually design algorithms, try to improve things, I mostly code by myself, uh, which means I ask my PhD students to code. Um, and more general purpose software for practitioners, uh, the most famous two are the bugs, Bayesian inference using Gibbs sampling. Uh, there are several versions, uh, depends on what operation system you use, but open bugs and JAX are the two that are, uh, that are under continued uh, development. Uh, another newcomer, uh, but very powerful, uh, very uh, prosperous is this STAN, um, made available by a team at Columbia University led by statistician and uh, political scientist, Andrew Gelman, uh, there's 30 some people and they're actively updating and there's a good community uh, to offer support, okay? So here Stan is actually in honor of uh, the person who invented Monte Carlo in order to make the hydrogen bomb. Uh, that's U Stan, U Stan Ulam, okay? So co-inventor of hydrogen bomb. Um, all right, so there are many other uh, packages written in different languages available in different platforms. Uh, I'll just mention this Mamba. Uh, written by in Julia, and because that's developed locally um, by Brian Smith from the Biostatistics Department at the University of Iowa, and uh, one of his students is our uh, ACT Next team member, Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Uh, and I believe Benjamin's uh, dissertation uh, invented a very interesting and novel tool of diagnostics. Okay, and actually Benjamin will be able to answer a question like, well, how long should I run this Markov chain? You do have local expert. Okay, uh, oh, here's a general purpose software for convergence diagnostics. Okay, uh, the most famous ones are CODA. It's actually uh, cited or like called from within the other uh, packages a lot. Uh, and again, out of this original team of CODA, Kate Koss is my colleague in the Department of Statistics. Uh, and there's also some other package that say, tell you what's the standard error of your Monte Carlo estimates. Mm, many choices out there. Um, is there a question or? All right, so I will uh, say a little bit more about Bugs and Stan, since they are probably the most popular as far as I know. Uh, Bugs is built upon the idea of implementing Gibbs sampler. Um, and when conditional distributions are not easy to sample from directly, they use extra strategies. In contrast, Stan implements Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and its variation actually not, no U-turn. Uh, and it also implements some variational approximation methods. As I said, it's conti under continued development, whatever is a good tool for Bayesian computing, um, they might be looking at it. All right, so the bug software uh, works for any distribution. Okay, you name it. But for Stan, recall the Hamilton, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo idea really needs the gradient. You need to kind of get the slope of this uh, density. So it only applies to continuous distribution. That's a, that's a big limit. Um, and another thing is uh, in terms of specifying the model, 
uh, box generally requires proper priors, um, which means a true probability density as prior, whereas then allows improper priors, uh, for example, say a flat prior over the entire real line, which can't really be normalized into a true density, but as long as that leads to a proper posterior distribution, the posterior, if that is the uh, true probability density, uh, the MCMC and the inference are all meaningful, okay? Um, so I would say what then does allows more flexibility, but it also uh, depends on the user being responsible. You actually have to do some analytical calculations to make sure the posterior is proper. Otherwise, no matter how long you run the chain, it's useless, it's not going to converge. Even if you see it's converging, that's misleading. Okay. Okay, in terms of user interface, uh, the two softwares are very similar. Uh, they allow analysis of arbitrarily large and complex model structures. They use simple modeling language. Uh, in theory, if you can write down your model, y equals to x beta plus epsilon, epsilon follows normal, something like that, all you need to do is to translate that into box language or stand language, uh, use their grammar, okay? So there's no technical hurdle over there. And you can call uh, these uh, programs from within uh, your favorite uh, software like R, okay? So um, it's pretty convenient. And a natural question is when I am facing a problem, should I use Stan or JAX? I could look at uh, examples um, and I would say it's not too hard to learn to use these and uh, given the low cost of building this, low cost of implementing these models, why don't you just try both, right? Um, this page says Stan has a reputation of being state of the art. It produces nearly independent samples in numerous empirical examples for which standard MCMC like the random walk metropolis we saw do not mix well. And um, I can mention one example here. Uh, I want to give an example that's related to ACT tasks. So I'm pretty biased in choosing a work that my husband is involved in. Uh, so Yong He, Rui Tao Liu, and Zhong Min Cui had this NCME uh, presentation uh, called Bayesian Estimation of a Null Category in Ordered Polytomous Item. It's a very fancy title. Uh, but anyway, the point is they uh, proposed a Bayesian model uh, that you know, can hansing, ha handle the missing categories and other things. And it ends up giving you inference that recovers the truth very well. Um, computational wise, that's what's relevant to this talk. Uh, I think Ray Tao was in charge of computing and he actually tried open box, we call that implement skip sampler first. And he waited for six hours. It produced a lot of highly independent samples. And in the end, it still goes up and down, uh, like it just doesn't stabilize, okay? So he ran it out of, uh, until he runs out of patience. And then he tried Stan, okay? Which runs a version of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And it produced uh, four parallel chains, 250 each. Whoa, um, okay, I think he used parallel. Rate. My relation, okay, I'll confirm. But it's almost independent samples if you check uh, the autocorrelation plots and it gave him a reasonable answer in six minutes. So for this particular example and for the data set they're interested in, Stan is the clear winner, okay? And the competition result could change if you simply change the data or it could change if you change the data structure. So it really depends. It doesn't hurt to try both. Okay, uh, that's my part two about how easy it is to do MCMC nowadays. Before I move on to how hard it is to do MCMC, any questions? Okay, um, I assume there's no questions. No, All but right. Benjamin says uh, hi. Oh, he sure, I, hi Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear from you, yes. Um, so, um, okay, now the hard part. Uh, a review of what we did earlier. Given a target distribution pi, uh, wow, I'm almost running out of time. Okay, so I'll be rather quick. Uh, given distribution pi, uh, we know how to construct a Markov chain now. We know how to form an estimator for posterior quantities we want, okay? 
the theory that makes this procedure valid uh, is the following, and it's actually pretty easy to prove. You have convergence in the distribution, and you have convergence in the estimator, okay? And it's, in, in contrast, it's generally hard to prove that Markov chain converges fast enough to give you a stable estimator, to have a finite variability of the estimator, okay? It needs to converge, for example, exponentially fast, uh, and that will give you a central limit theorem. And the importance of a central limit theorem in practice, it allows you the report of margin of errors. There are a lot of details I'm going to skip, but the point is it's hard analytical analysis for part two. Okay, so the last page is theory. The theory involves a lot of math. In practice, not everyone can go through the theory and actually my expertise is to, you know, prove convergence rate of Markov chain. I can still only work on pretty baby examples, okay? The more complicated, fancier ones, they look they are right. I don't know how fast they converge in theory. So in practice, we have to have some solution even if they're ad hoc, okay? Recall we need some warm up for the chain to run long enough to that they have distribution close to pi and additional ones, uh, which means you start collecting good samples and use that for estimation. So for part one, how long should run the warm up? Uh, it concerns diagnosis for convergence. Actually, from my opinion, okay, if you know where the center region or good region of uh, the distribution pi is, just choose a starting point there, and you can start running. You don't need warm up, okay? So warm up is for you do when you don't know, you have no idea where the center of the chain is. Uh, you want the chain itself to explore a little bit to give you a you know warm start, a good start. Uh, but anyway, the uh, common practice is first to do diagnosis for convergence for a certain chain. Um, the point is, if not using analytical knowledge, just by observing evidence, you can never prove convergence. How do you know uh, if you're exploring the entire distribution well or you're just exploring one mode of the posterior distribution well? You might be ignoring the whole universe out there, right? So you need some analytical knowledge to be sure. But when you don't, there's still ad hoc methods. Uh, first up, you definitely need to visualize, and there are some uh, common uh, ways to decide. I'll just uh, show you a couple of pictures. Uh, the first one is a chain that uh, mixes pretty well. Uh, the second one is it gets stuck in certain areas. And you can also look at the correlation uh, plot to see how dependent the samples are. Okay. Um, but anyway, there are plenty of diagnoses available out there. Um, so... Uh, second up, once you collected data, you want to know if you collected sample, you want to know how accurate they are. And, um, and there are some software allows you to estimate the standard error. Okay, I think I'll maybe use two minutes each on the examples. Um, the first one is Bayesian regression. Uh, it's a work uh, my student Ray Jin did for his PhD dissertation. He is graduating this month. Um, in a regression problem, you have a response, you have potential predictors, you want to find the influential predictors, make predictions for newcomers, and assess the uncertainty of effects. Okay? Um, so there are Bayesian variable selection model that does this, but it's extremely costly to compute. So what my student and I dealt with was the version that's continuous that mimic the performance of the Bayesian variable selection. And uh, our goal is to find uh, more efficient ways to do the computing. And by the way, note, because Bayesian variable selection involves exploring this discrete space of two to the piece power mode models, it's not continuous. You cannot use HMC, okay? So you have to go back to the uh, more old-fashioned uh, metropolis Hastings. Okay, so for this Bayesian shrinkage models, basically we did some theory behind. We checked existing uh, Gibbs sample and Hamiltonian uh, they all have their problems, either, well, either slow convergence or extremely costly, or I have no guarantee of the theoretical properties. What we did is we made use of our knowledge of the posterior and decided we need to block the two posterior, the two components that have high posterior correlations. And without making the computing more costly, we hugely increased the speed. Uh, sorry, we hugely increase the uh, efficiency of our exploration, okay? So we proved some uh, theoretical properties. 
and yep, that was our work. And empirical performance was great. Oh, just to show you, it took us three seconds and took Stan 80 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, so this page, maybe you're a little more interested in this. I thought about possible projects uh, of my work, how that related to IRT models. Um, here is um, the probability distribution of answering of the P student answering the ice item correct. Okay, you're probably familiar with this component of 2PL. Um, so you can do a Bayesian version of this IRT model. And my uh, thinking is, for the computing, the different parametrization matters a lot. You could be dealing with the same statistical model. You will be dealing with the same statistical model, but how you specify the parameter will make a great difference, okay? Uh, I'll jump to two, which is easier to see. So right now the parametrization is you have A and B for item uh, features and theta, theta for student ability. And one simple reparametrization is instead of A and B, you use A and delta. Okay, delta is now A times B. Okay, it gives you the same model, literally. And uh, actually, Ray Tao used this idea on a frequentist model, and that's accepted by NPS this year. He proposed a, a model that allows versatile prior. Hmm? No, okay. Um, prior for the student ability, but still frequentist analysis for item uh, features. But anyways, what he did was he proved that under the reparametrization, the marginal likelihood over A and delta is actually log concave. That's a very nice shape that allows the computing to be much easier. Okay, it's like if you have an easy target, no matter what computing method you use, they're going to work well. If you have a very hard target before the transformation, uh, no matter what you use, it could be, you know, very challenging. Okay. All right. Another potential project is you can uh, come up with any model you're interested in and try Gibbs from Box or HMC instead and see which one performs better. Some of the available resources are listed here. Okay. Um, I know I'm running over time, but here's the message. HMC Hamiltonian is the state of the art, but it really depends. Okay. Old fashioned methods can be useful. Uh, the point is, if you make an effort to take advantage of features of the posterior distribution, you can come up with better MCMC solutions. And here are a few tricks. Um, since black box software are so easy to use now, just try them. All right, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Asim. Uh, any questions, please? Can you see the chat? Oh, uh, chat. Oh, maybe that's the that's what's dinging along. I, You're getting compliments on your presentation. <laughs> so. oh, okay, chat. Okay, I see <laughs> ten. Ah. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, where's the question? There's one. Oh, are there? So, is that the formal method for determining the size of n zero? Is that the one? Uh, uh, no, Jeff oh, Allen at the bottom. Oh, okay. Oh, hi, Jeff. Um, do you have any experience with SAS MSTEMS? The easy question is no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't. Actually, I haven't even had much experience with Box and HMS uh, and STAN. I learned to use them for this talk. I, I code my own. That, that's the problem. <laughs> so, Sorry. Um, I have one question. Uh, so are there any advantages uh, using uh, Bayesian uh, computing with the hidden micro models? Hidden Markov models. Um, I would say hidden Markov models itself is Bayesian. So whenever you have a hierarchical model, there are latent features and you assume distributions on the latent features, it's Bayesian. So uh, by saying Bayesian hidden Markov model is simply adding another layer of prior on the parameters itself. So I think it's the most natural thing to do. Um, but uh, I think computational wise, I don't think there should be a big hurdle. Uh, when you look at the forward propagation, backward propagation in Hamilton 
in hidden Markov model, actually also, you know, generating from the conditional probabilities that's similar technique as the MCMC technique I'm using here. So I think the answer is positive. Uh, it should be easy to run and should give you a better picture of the unknown parameters. Thanks. Mm -hmm. There is one more question uh, from Dr. Gunter Maris. Uh, Adam, can you read? Oh, scale. Okay. Uh, our biggest problem is scale. 300,000 kids doing 215 items in real time. Stan will not help, nor any other general purpose software. Um, so I'm just making guesses here. I understand the data is overwhelming the computing ability. Um, so um, is it possible to do a little bit analytical uh, work to say integrate the kids variable and say then now for the 215 items and their parameters, uh, maybe you can use the analytical approximation. Um, I don't know, I understand because also the question on SAS, maybe SAS can handle larger data set. So I have advantage of using the MCMC uh, SAS. So maybe look there. Uh, I do not have a, a good answer to this. This is a very challenging problem. And then the next one is okay. from Timo. How would you deal with the non-identifiability of the IRT model? And that is theta C, maybe you can read the rest, theta C, D minus C equals theta D. Uh, for example, I think C here kind of represents the center of the ability of students' population. Uh, I would say the theta minus D is the more natural parametrization. Uh, you want to use the parametrization. You want first write down, down the model in a parametrization that makes sense, okay? And I think typically you would, because of the non-identifiability, kind of artificial, you could center theta at zero. Say you assume it has a distribution that has mean zero, and then that solves part of this identifiability problem. Uh, and I think Bayesian, uh, especially Bayesian, you're allowed to assign a prior to theta or the center of the theta. And that, say, if you assign the prior center to be zero, that is solving the identifiability problem. Um, I, I recommend the Bayesian IRT, I think there's a Bayesian IRT book and also a paper that talked about this situation. Uh, so maybe we can discuss the reference uh, after this. Uh, Gunter uh, follows up, we do know how to deal with scale, but it's all special purpose algorithms. The best one having vanishing autocorrelation as a sample size grows. And then Timo's follow up is, so you identify via the prior? Does that make sense? Uh, we do know how to deal with scale, but it's all special purpose. Mm, I don't understand the first sentence. Okay, the second one. That one. Uh, Looks like Gunter has answered Timo. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess I'm not an expert in IRT model, so it, it will take more time to discuss this. Yeah. Another question from Evan, is there a compelling reason to use MCMC over analytical methods when the distribution for the variable of interest is straightforward. For example, when estimating the proportion for a binomial, binomially distributed variable. Okay, here's the answer. Uh, it might doesn't matter if you have enough data, the Bayesian posterior will have almost the same behavior as the likelihood function. You will get enough information. It is when that Bayesian and frequentists give different answers, would you question which one is better? Then I would ask uh, if your prior is reasonable. If there's expert belief, there's domain information that tells you the true proportion theta should be around 0.2, but the data overwhelmingly says otherwise. This is the case where the Bayesian result and the frequency result will be different. So what you should do is not to go ahead and do analysis. The question, is this data correct? Am I, am I, getting, am I trying to solve the, a, a well-defined problem?
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asin Tan, for very uh, informative and uh, mathematically rich uh, tech talk. Your uh, presentation uh, will be certainly useful for our uh, uh, different projects. And thanks uh, also to Dr. Lu Wu for very nice introduction. Uh, also, uh, thanks to all the participants for your participation as well as uh, taking good uh, good questions uh, with the speakers. Thanks. I want to acknowledge uh, all my other team members from ACT Next, Andrew Cantony, Adam Brock, Debra Glass, uh, Eric, Matt, as Tony for uh, their support for making this talk successful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for your time. Hope to have lunch at ACT sometime in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.